The title of my message, it may be a misnomer, but you know, uh, Job's wife, talking about wives, let me pick on the wives. She turned around to Job after all the attacks, and she says, you still hold on to your integrity, to paraphrase it. Why don't you curse your God and die? I believe Satan entered her. Just like Satan entered Peter when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because those are the same words that Satan had told the Lord. He'll curse you to your face. And if you know the story of Job, let me just uh, extract the concept and put it in my own words. Job just serves you because he enjoys the gift and not the giver. There's many Christians today that are serving the Lord for what he gives. I say they're serving an ATM God. Oh, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, 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 me. Many Christians in many churches. Pentecost was very guilty of it. I came out of Pentecostal church. And so what about connecting with the Lord? What about becoming one with him? What about the intimacy? Forming the intimacy with the Lord. Jason was talking about, he was preaching my message. But in different words, we're saying the same thing as the other preacher. What? It's good to ask ourselves questions. Am I serving the Lord for what I can get? That's what Satan told the Lord. The Lord said, oh, no. Job is righteous. And he said, well, let me touch him. Let me touch what he has. And the demonic powers went to work. Satan was behind him. Remember fire from heaven came? It wasn't fire from heaven. Make him think that God was against him. Many times God allows these things to come upon our lives. And we get to see the behind the scenes of Job. It was to test him. Thank God for trials. You heard my this morning when we were sitting at the table downstairs, my wife gave her testimony there about what she doesn't like the trials but she thanks God that they show her where she's at and they show her where she needs to rely on the Lord I think those that heard it I thought oh, that's pretty good Yolanda took the words right out of my mouth in Arizona they conducted a test I was talking about that downstairs so you that heard it act like you never heard it go oh wow Ooh, okay humor me in Arizona they build a big dome several acres they wanted to find out and see how they could prevent trees from falling in other places, not only in Arizona, but they picked it in Arizona. They planted these trees to shield them from the wind. And so these trees, after a while, they grew and they toppled over under their own weight. The scientists couldn't understand. There's no wind and the trees fell. So upon investigating this, they found that the wind is what gives that tree the opportunity to develop its strength. The more the wind, the deeper the roots. And I use that as an analogy of the trials in our lives. I gave my testimony Thursday during testimony service. That's what strengthened me. I haven't arrived, but like I said, maybe we're not where we should be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. A mess. And so these are questions you can ask yourself. Am I serving God for what I can get? Or will I, like Job, say, Lord, though you slay me, I will serve you. And Job maintained his integrity. The title of this message is The Importance of Integrity in Leadership. I was going to give that message for a men's leadership conference, but it was canceled, so Mike asked me, I still have your title. Now, there's other options. I could have titled it The Battle for Spiritual Integrity. And in a moment, I'm going to give definitions because I'm a definition person. The importance of integrity in deliverance or integrity for holding your deliverance. And this is what the devil wants to do. In a moment, I'll give you the definition, biblical definitions. But he wants you, like Job, not to hold on to your integrity during trials. Just because your wife turns against you and she won't serve the Lord, my testimony, Thursday, my wife does, isn't offended when I say she opposed me when I came to the Lord. She said, I'm Catholic. All right, I'm not going to force you, but I prayed. And the things that started coming upon her, she ran to the Lord and made the Lord Jesus Christ her Lord. Not my God, her God, but the Lord Jesus Christ is her God in the same way with each one of my children. 
I don't make any bones about it. Sometimes people that don't have discernment, they go, oh, you're bragging, you're bragging. Yes, on my Lord. Learn to extract the concept. The main idea is that the Lord can take a nobody, beaten down, laying in the street, drunk and full of drugs, and get him behind a pulpit to tell others, it's okay, I've been there. I know what you feel. To identify, to connect with the people you love, God's people. To put you in one mind and one accord and say, brother, I know what you're going through, brother. I know what you're going through. I went through that. I have a lifelong life of backsliding. Preaching from this pulpit under Pastor Worley, Pastor Harder, and Pastor Mike. And some people tell me, how come you don't have your own church? Because that's not my calling. The Lord has made me a watchman to pray. Oh, I'm not an apostle. You know, that was mentioned, Jay. Uh, Brother Worley mentioned it, Pastor Mike. These guys handing out cards, apostles, nothing but pride. I say, read your Bible. You cannot be an apostle. You're a disciple. But the sad thing is that many churches are not leading people into discipleship. And then as Oswald Chamber says, the end of discipleship and the beginning of friendship, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. Because the servant doesn't know what his master say knowledge. He says, but I called you friends. They had gone from discipleship to friendship. And that's where I want to be. A friend of the Lord. He's my best friend. But many times I'm not his friend. All the backsliding, which I don't have any remorse over that. He took all of that. And so many churches are not teaching discipleship. And that's done through teaching deliverance. It's to remove all the obstacles that keep you from moving forward. Brother Jason was talking about that. And I learned to be a good listener. Got a lot of deliverance. And incomprehension. And I'm saying he's preaching my message, but through in different words. God's part, we can't do. That's what he was saying. Our part, God will not do. He's not our ATM God. There are requirements in the Bible for every one of us as a Christian to grow in discipleship and then into friendship with God. Remember what a friend of God is? Shall I tell Abraham, my friend, what I'm going to do? Hey, Abraham, he wasn't asking Abraham for permission. I plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, oh, Lord, what if there's 50 righteous souls? No, I won't destroy. He's conversing with Abraham, a friend. Only two people in the Bible are referred to as friends of God. I think it was Abraham and Moses, wasn't it? But then when he tells his disciple, I no longer call you servant. Because a servant doesn't know. But I have to, everything that I received from my father, I've told you. Knowledge, he taught him. He instructed these learners. Now they were moving. It shows a progression. I no longer call you servants. A progression into friendship with God. Wow. That's what I want. And I asked the Lord, Lord, will you send revival like you did in the Welch, Welch Revival? I want to ask you one thing, Lord. You know how I resisted preaching. You would know that from my introverted life where I didn't even want to speak. And the Lord called me to be a preacher and we took the word of God in many places, help establish deliverance ministries in, in established churches in Latin America, the United States, my wife. So I had to speak. Lord, one thing I want to ask you, if revival comes, will you let me be one of the preachers behind the pulpit that stirs up the demons in the people. Like in the Welch revival, they came out into the aisles screaming, I'm a sinner, save me, Lord. Demons manifesting everywhere. Then because of the lack of spiritual warfare, Satan moved in there, like Pastor Mike's been talking about the God of this world. He is the God of this world. Did I set my timer off? <laughs> He's the God of this world. And they did not use spiritual warfare during the Welsh revival, 50 years. And so Satan moves in there. I've studied War on the Saint seven times. Studied, I didn't say read, read. 
And I recommend it. Some people say they can't get through it. Because it's all where you are with the Lord. Like Oswald Chambers in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, somebody made a comment, it's so difficult to understand. Somebody said, well, put it away for a while. And they grew spiritually. They said, oh, my God, it wasn't that it was difficult. It's my condition where I was at. Jesus talked about the condition of the heart, the seed and the sower, that crushed, tender heart that becomes very tender through these trials. And you scream out to the Lord. It's okay to scream out to the Lord. I can't take it. Pastor Mike suffering frustration because the ministry requires that the pastor and the ministers give of their life, give of their time to the point of exhaustion, Paul said. Where he said, I strive, that means I agonize for that mark. I have it in my notes, but I've lost. I've got 20 pages of notes. Somebody asked me, how long does it take me to prepare a message? I said, I can't tell you. I study every day diligently. Make no, oh, you're bragging on yourself, brother. Put me through the test and let's see where you are. Every day. And when I have to preach, I pray and I say, Lord, oh, okay, this is a good page. They're all good. And I think, oh, my God, you're speaking so much to us about integrity. And that's the problem with the church is you have the integrity of the church. What is integrity? People know what integrity is? When, uh, when they're going to knock down a skyscraper, they put dynamite on the bottom. And they compromise that integrity, the structure, and it crumbles. During 9-11, when those jets hit the Twin Towers, they compromised the integrity and they came crumbling down. Your backbone is what gives your body its structure, its frame. Integrity is your frame, what you're built of, what you're made of. Like I said, you must make the Word of God an integral part of you. That means the completeness of you. An internal and integral part, just reading it isn't good enough. Chewing on it, asking the Lord questions, and saying, Lord, give me comprehension. I lack comprehension. We were talking downstairs, and I'll mention it. When I went to college at the age of 48 years old, I had a weak foundation. Adjective, adverb, intransitive verb, transitive verb, prepositional phrase. If I learned it in school, I forgot it. An illative. And so I had to go back to the eighth grade books, but I had received so much deliverance I started to comprehend. And when I saw that that comprehension was leading me to comprehending the Word of God, because they're words, I wanted more. And so the Lord kept delivering me and I understood. I'm an advocate of education, so is the Lord. Look a little deeper into the scripture. Look at the universities. Pastor Mike's been talking about the God of this world. Yes. Harvard, you'd, oh, Pastor John Harvard, one of the founders of Harvard University, Oxford, these pastors that came together and started these, what they call them as monastic schools. And then they started the, what do they call the other, con, uh, Covenant schools or whatever. And it was all for the purpose of teaching the Bible. The Bible for a thousand years was a textbook. Oxford University was established to teach the Bible by these godly men. And I have in my notes here, I wrote down the plaques that still exist in these universities, although Satan has hijacked them. Had they, if they had spiritual warfare and deliverance, could that have happened? The Lord gave something good. And these Christians moved out. Let me preach impromptu because I'm lost on my notes. These Christians moved out and made a difference in the world. Christian missionaries went to different places to teach people how to read. And they distributed Bibles everywhere. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so that was a purpose. And they got out, but then they got tainted, taken over, and corrupted. And I won't go on and on of life after Jesus came. Life expectancy was half. I'm 73 years old and healthy as a man could be. Oh, I have a little aches and pains once in a while when I overdo it. If I mow an acre of lawn 
would have pushed more, I start to hurt a little bit. But when my tractor was done, I had to do that. But he gave us health. And he gave us mind, the renewment of our mind through his word. And like Jason was putting that principle forth, what are you doing with it? God's part we can't do, our part he will not do. Before Jesus, philosophers have written down what was occurring during these times. Babies were being killed. If you had a deformed baby, you know what? Because Brian lifts up the prayer request that touches me all the time, the lost and missing children. I take it to my closet because that's sad. I had children. All of a sudden, your ch children, you look out there, they're not out there. Brother Jason and the frantic wife screaming, my kids, my kids, and they're never found again. They're in a foreign, foreign country being prostituted. How horrible. But they would take these flawed children, deformed children, and they would throw them into the river. This philosopher writes it. It's documented. You can look it up. Life before Jesus. And they said, oh, no, no, that was wisdom in doing that. We didn't want monstrous, defective children. Well, you know what? My daughter, three years ago, had a Down syndrome child. Precious to us. He's going to have a learning disability. He's three years old. And he's not comprehending like other children. But you know what? We love him. And so when the Christians, this was after Jesus, would dive into those rivers, some of them had alligators, and grab these deformed children and hug them and take them in and adopt them, they mocked them. Because that was the Roman way and the heathen way. They killed their sick and their poor. They have no use for you. Well, look at the doctrine of Jesus. That's who he came for. Jason mentioned that he's preaching my message. Basic things and things which are despised has he called in. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. Somebody had the nerve to tell me, but brother, Jesus called basic things and things which are despised and you're learned. In other words, you can't be saved. I'd say, no, read the scripture. Not many. Not only that, I was an alcoholic laying in the street, losing my life, my family, and the Lord scraped me up. How base can you get? Where did the Lord scrape you from? I was at the bottom of the barrel. And he gave me life and more abundantly. That's enough for me to praise him. And if he never gave me another day of life, I'm not afraid to die. What, three scores, 60 plus 10 by grace or whatever? I passed it by three years, 73. I'll be 74 my next birthday. My wife is 70. He's given me enough. But have I done my best for Jesus? I don't think so. There's more I could have done. So we see that sometimes you have religious spirits in the congregations. We all have them. And you have a spirit, Pastor Willie calls it, a spirit of insecurity intimidation when a brother moves in intelligence and spiritual gifts and everything jealousy sets in and now that gift that's your cult because the gifts are so powerful that you know things that you wonder why do you think they call them seers but you keep it you take it to the Lord in prayer because you hurt for others that's what Jesus did. Simon, the Pharisee, I have one thing against you. Since I came into your home, you never even offered me water for my feet. That was customary. If you go to countries like Mexico, they give you what? They'll wash your feet. And this woman, since I, she came here, she hasn't stopped washing my feet with her tears, a comparison there. I have one thing because... Simon was over there. I don't know if the Lord used discernment by detection. He didn't have to. He had spiritual discernments, two types of discernments. Simon the Pharisee standing there looking. If he were a prophet, he would know what type of woman she was. Was. Because her heart had been changed. She was a woman of the streets. But she's crying. 
And he says, Simon, there were two people that had a debt. This one owed a little bit and this one owed a lot and couldn't pay it. And they're all there debt was forgiven who do you think would love the Lord more he said well the one that was forgiven more but he still did not see that it was that woman who was closer to the Lord because her heart was in the right place in her gratefulness I preached three four messages from this pulpit while Pastor Mike was gone some time ago on gratefulness Romans chapter 8 they soon forgot remember Remember, at least you start to think that you did it on your own. You're up there, Pastor Willie used this. You're up there on the roof, Mr. Roofer over there, and they're on the roof nailing, and then start sliding off that, uh, that peak. Lord, help me, help me, and coveralls get hooked on it. It's okay, God, I got it. A lot of Christians, I pray for a lot of people in deliverance. We just call the demons out. But anyways, when, after Jesus came, life was, we lived twice as long. Things were changed. The Christians made a difference. They took out help to these countries where the poor were at. They fed the poor. They went to widows' houses. They formed orphanages. Sure, Satan's the god of this world, the cosmos, all the evil. And he's hijacked a lot, even churches like the Welch Revival. Even churches that I know of where the demons are just running rampant because they don't have spiritual warfare and deliverance. But I'm not even going to get to my message, but that's okay. The Warfare Prayer Book. It's all scribbled up. This isn't the first one. Some of them fell apart because my wife and I and our family was in such desperate need when we came here that we clung to every word of the word of God that came from this pulpit, Pastor Worley. Three years after we had been here receiving deliverance, he asked me to preach, and I was terrified, introverted. He said, we won't force you, son. And then again, he asked me, and I started preaching. My first message was on different types of prayer in 1987, because my wife and I had the ministry of intercession. All we did was pray and fast, because of what, in our gratefulness for what the Lord, Lord had done, that was our calling. But if you look in the Warfare Prayer Book, because this workshop is about warfare, and Jason included something, I'm sure Bud will, by the titles, and Pastor Mike sure did. Not all the prayer books have this on the inside cover. People just do not understand what the Ministry of Deliverance is. Pastor Worley wrote in the inside, Preparation to Receive Deliverance. One of the best preparations you can make before receiving deliverance is to read carefully the books and booklets in the Jose Hell series written by Pastor Wynn Worley. This will save a great deal of explanation and time for the methods and approaches used in deliverance are described in great detail in the books. I agree with that. That's how we learned. I read all of his books several times. Fasting one or more days coupled with intensive Bible study and personal prayer immediately preceding a deliverance session has also proved to be a valuable aid. Now, do we do that? Because I talked to several people, well, I've gotten prayer and I've gotten prayer and I still have this thing in my head. And are you doing? The doer is blessed, not just the hearer only. And then it says, those who have followed the preliminary steps of renunciation prayers, Brother Jason was mentioning the importance of forgiveness. Without forgiveness, you're not going to give very far. You are forgiven and you're expected to forgive. No matter what it takes, and forgiveness is divine. The Lord will give it to you to forgive others. What does it say in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15? Looking diligently, making an energetic effort, looking diligently, lest a root of bitterness take ground in you and trouble you and thereby defile many. You affect many. And where does it come bitterness? From not forgiving. If that's the way the Lord is taking this, that's the way it's going to go. It says outline, okay, ready, okay, those preliminary steps of renunciation, prayers, etc., outlined in the books are ready to move directly into deliverance. 
We would recommend for those new to deliverance ministry to read and study booklets, War for Prayers, that's number four, binding and loosing curses and soul ties, invading enemy territory, inviting demonic attacks, holding your deliverance, getting started in deliverance, God's plan for leadership. That's important. So many people there talking about the leadership. Whatever is said from this pulpit, you can discuss it, it's public. But talking behind the pastor's back and backstabbing because you see his faults and failures, he's a human being, any pastor. When King Saul came against David, this bipolar, I can say bipolar because he went up and down in his moods, demonically driven King Saul, when the man that killed King Saul came to David, Oh, the enemy of my Lord is dead. How dare you raise your hand against God anoint, God's anointed. When the apostle Paul said, Paul, an apostle Jesus Christ by the will of God and not of man. This was a calling. A leader, a pastor could only be a pastor if God calls him. With all his faults and failures. But when it came to his personality, he said, I am the worst I was the worst, the least of the apostles, because I persecuted the church. Here you have this blasphemer. And I've heard preachers say, oh, but he was blameless. No, read Philippians according to the flesh and the law, which was now a curse. The moment Jesus Christ died on the cross, after that the apostle Paul now, what the Jews practiced was now blasphemy, trying to observe the law. It was now salvation by grace. That's why he said I was a blasphemer. The least of the apostles. But anyways, it goes on here. The booklets to read this helps. How many of us do that? If we're honest with ourselves. And then Pastor Willie says in this here. And I like what Jason was covering. The, the reason the Lord took it that way. And I guess my notes are scrap again. Uh, Chris, the Christian's power of attorney. Jason covered some of that. And it's all in the name of Jesus. The power is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been given a name above every, every, every name. And he's given us delegated authority. Power, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. We don't have to run like chickens. The world's falling apart. Oh, uh, the Illuminati. And if, yeah, I know that. That's elementary. But I tell you what, that's why we pray for our country. And if my people were called by name, name, that's us, would humble themselves out here their land, putting the responsibility on us. Stop pointing the finger. Are you interceding? Are you praying for your country diligently and even fasting like some churches do? The Christian power of attorney, it is essential to believe the gospel in everything it teaches for believers, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Repentance, again, and renunciation of all sin and wrongdoing is another requirement. And he quotes the scripture. Repentance, what is repentance? Lord, uh, forgive me of my sins. Yes. Repentance means having a change of direction. Has your life had a change of direction in that area? If not, then you haven't really repented. Having a change of direction, a change of mind, a change of heart. Renunciation means to disown it. Oh, Lord, why? Why? You're drinking alcohol. You're corrupting your mind. You're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're involved in ungodly acts. When you get on there and you're looking at this filth and this pornography, that's not for Christians. You're defeating the purpose. You're not casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge God and bring into captivity. I bind you, demons. That's what it takes. And that's what makes these promises real. You start to see them. There's three types of promises in the Bible. But God, you promised. You did it promise? What about the if you do this, I will do that? To me, that's a conditional promise. If you fulfill this condition, here, I give you a check, brother. Only if you sign it and cash it will you get what's promised on that check. And so... 
People run away with it. God promised healing, healing. Uh, let's look at the scripture. Why many times our healing doesn't come? Look at the, what he said, what Jesus said. Go and sin no more. If you lack comprehension, you won't understand. Go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Implying, implicitly, that this man's illness was due to his sin. I saw somewhere advertising that these homosexuals are protesting and everything because the government has spent more money for AIDS. You ever stop think maybe that's a curse come upon you for being so unnatural and violating the word of God? Romans chapter 1, when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. God gave them over. There's a giving over. A oh, goody God, he wouldn't do that. He love, 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 love. He's a God of love and a God of justice and a God of vengeance. And there's some things that go against his character that he has to do. And hopefully before I run out of time, I'm running out of time. I haven't even got into my message. Renunciation, repentance and renunciation of all wrongdoing is another requirement. Obedience to the gospel, doers. Obedience to the gospel and seeking for endowment of power. Luke 11, 13, and so on. Surrender to God. Get a soul tie with the Lord. Yield to Him. Give Him the preeminence. Connect with Him. Through prayer isn't about, for me, prayer is not about asking. Sure, it's, there's a part in it where we ask. Just like in a marriage, they say, oh, communication is of the utmost important. Yes. You have no communication with the Lord. You don't connect with him. Lord, what is it you want me to do? Jesus said, all that I do pleases the Father. Seeking to please God. I preach messages from this pulpit, about three or four of them on, on pleasing God. 1 Samuel 2.30, it says, those that honor me, I will honor. It's reciprocal. Those that dishonor me, I will lightly esteem. From the Hebrew, that means you're cursed. Turning your nose up on the Lord and walking away. And there's people that do that. And so, surrender to God and walk and live in the spirit. The word walk is used for your character. What's an integral part of you? You're moving forward. When I went to school, I saw a lot of college students. They were what we call extrin extrinsic learners. They study, 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 study to pass the test. Somebody told me, you remember that from so many years? Yes, because I was intrinsic. Those were the Pharisees. Oh, they could mouth off, lip service and everything. Put heavy loads on people, but they themselves wouldn't do it. They weren't doers. Intrinsic. He said, if you do this, this will happen. And if we look at our testimony, has he lied yet? No. And so, believe in your mission in life as a representative of God. Know your position in Christ. I'm going to tell you why that's important. Because there's so many demons in people, including the churches. A Christian lives his life in three different levels. You heard me say that. Carnal and spiritual. But in the carnal, there's the sensual Christian. Eh, and I hate to repeat these things. I preach on them, but I don't think we go to church today. It's going to rain. That's a very sensual person. A person given to their appetites and their desires. And then you have the soulish Christian. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, they could quote the scripture left and right. They're intellectuals. And then you have the spiritual. And all of us go from one to the other to the other because we're in, a, in the flesh. We're a fallen nature. There's messages there. But anyways, uh, uh, I won't go too much into warfare. A message on YouTube, 1808. In 1820, I explained the two kingdoms at battle. But I'm going to cover part of my message since I used up most of my time, thanks to Jason. But anyway, so the Lord was convicting me there and reminding me of things that when I was meditating, these you can hear it, same concepts, 
same principles, right, as Pastor Mike also. And I'm sure Brother Bud is going to come up and we're going to connect. Every, the Holy Spirit will connect it. Many times we don't even know what to pray for. Sometimes when I'm meditating and praying, the meditation is totally different than, oh, Shaw is chewing, masticating on the word. Hmm, looking up words. If you have your Bibles, look at Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. And I'm going to paraphrase it. You follow with me. No, maybe I should look at it. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Uh, Jason preached on Matthew. The, the Gospels are my, one of my favorites. Well, the whole Bible is. And looky here. We're our part. Oh, and let me finish this, because I get lost in secondary thoughts, like most preachers do, a lot of them. A lot of them are very skillful to bring it right back where they were, you know, but I'll admit it. Uh, I get sidetracked. It. The reason these people cannot be apostles, and I'm going to put it down. A brother told me, he listened to me preach since he was six years old. He said, brother, I always loved your preaching because you put the cookies on the lower shelf. Right, brother? And I've gotten feedback from others. Nothing complicated about it. Uh, an apostle, what is an apostle? What are the qualifications for an apostle? Jesus said, thou art Peter, little rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Paul said the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. I worked as a mechanical technician. We had gasoline, diesel when I was younger. I had two jet engines. And some guys would come in. It was a huge shot. Ooh, you guys must be intelligent. You work on jet engines. You work on all this complicated stuff. The guy that was intelligent is the guy that invented the church, I mean the jet engine, if you know what I mean. Brother Jason, would you go out and invent a car? You can't invent a car. It's already invented. Now, you can duplicate one in Arizona. There's a guy that builds these midget cars out of refrigerator steel. Beautiful. I don't know if you've ever seen them. And he gets in there and drives them. He can duplicate what's already been built, but he cannot invent the car. It's already been invented. The apostles set everything in Timothy. Paul told Timothy and Titus how to fill the church. When Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, he gave gifts. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Remember I talked about the Harvard comma pastor teachers as one. Apostles. So then, as you meditate, you say, Lord, let me see what the apostles were the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. You can go out and start churches. My wife and I waited and we started deliverance in churches that were established. The Lord opened the door for years. But we cannot start a church. It's already built. And so the apostles and the prophets were the foundation Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. He is the rock. And in Matthew 7 it says, you'll follow with me there. Matthew 7, uh, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, the doer, doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. You're building upon this foundation that has already been set. Jesus Christ, your salvation here. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. What a solid foundation. Build on that rock, Jesus Christ. And him crucified. Paul said, all I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he needed. Education? Oh, it may get you far in the world. It got me. Moved up on my job and everything. Office job. Had 200 people under me. Or that I served, I should say. Christianity, you were, you're a servant. 
And so it says the rain beat. Remember I told you about those trees, those roots grew deeper. That foundation cannot be shaken. But you build upon that rock with inferior materials, they're going to crumble. You put your wife, your children before the Lord, you're building with inferior materials. No one that puts mother, father, brother, sister before me is worthy to be my disciples, discipleship. Okay? And then it says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a fool. Every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doth them not, doth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. You ever see, I had to study, uh, what do they call it, topography and ground and all that, sinkholes? The lime under there where it's out in the house just sinks in the hole. It was built on a weak foundation. Make that foundation the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified and the word of God to get it into our hearts. And deliverance is a big part of it. Deliverance is a big part of it because the purpose of deliverance is not to make you feel better. That may be a byproduct. It's not to make you more intelligent. It leads you to become more spiritual. But it's to remove all the obstacles that keep you from lining up with the Lord. And building upon that foundation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says that there's only one foundation. Paul said it's already laid. He's a master builder. And then you build upon that foundation. Wood, hay, stubble. And these things are going to go through the fire. They're going to be tested. You're setting up your works for the first national bank of heaven. To quote Pastor Worthy. But you see right here. It puts the responsibility on the person building upon their foundation, your salvation is set. You can improve it. You can change it. Your spirit has been sealed to the day of redemption. However, our soul continues to be contaminated. And deliverance. The word of God, sometimes the entrance of the word gives understanding to the simple. You can get a lot of deliverance from studying the word of God. And when we have problems, this stubborn demons just won't leave. We go up and have brother priest pray for me. I've hit the floor before when I was young in this church. 37 years ago, I think. Jason was just a little weak guy. And he remembered my wife and me. But uh, build on that foundation. Jesus Christ. Pastor Mike was talking about Hollywood. Here, the remote control. My daughter says, Dad, television is such a waste of time. But you know what? Once in a while when I sit at TV and I watch some of them programs, my discernment kicks in. Oh, my God, look what they're feeding the public. And people are just gullible geese swallowing the whole cookie. You look at these families and these programs, there's nothing but dissension. And my wife and I, we live a very peaceful, quiet life in the Lord and I have the peace of God that passes all understanding when I was in the hospital the nurses came in and they're laughing they said you know we were talking about you I said really I said they're monitoring we saw your vitals and everything does your heart always slow down like that when you're sleeping and your breath goes down to a minimum like you're hibernating they never seen it I said that's the peace of God that passes all understanding and supposedly I was dying of COVID but my oxygen level was up there. But that's the peace of God, the quiet, calm heart. I'm not bragging. Let me brag on my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the work that he's done. The more you grow in the Lord, more, the more you see your faults and your failures, but also the more you see the glory of his work in your life. I see people, see no brother hadn't been here for years. He comes back, and the Lord is still working. He won't give up. Your salvation is set. You can't improve on it. But your soul, mind, will, and emotions continues to be contaminated. And your body is the seat of the appetites. It wants and it'll take. So besides spiritual warfare and binding and loosing, binding and loosing is a big one too. 
And it helps to die to self daily, crucify the flesh. Crucifixion is very painful. It, everything twitches. Paul said, I carry, and I'm going to use uh, an example that I've used before. Paul said, I carry about me this body of death. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And he said that I see that I serve the law of sin and death. But thank God for Jesus Christ. And years before that, kept the punishment for the Romans where if you killed somebody, you're guilty of murder. They tied them up, wrist for wrist, knee for knee, and ankle for ankle. You carried that dead body with you, and it stunk, and it was heavy, and the flies would come around it, and it was decaying, and it would fill you up with disease and everything. That's the analogy he used for carrying around this body of death. There's no good thing in the works of the flesh. But thank God through Jesus Christ our spirit has been sealed. And we're, it says, working out our own salvation, our own deliverance with fear and trembling. That's what we're doing in deliverance. May the Lord bless you. I, my, I'm out of time. Didn't even get, oh, God was one scripture there. But that's okay. Are you, have you been ministered to? That's all that matters. Praise the Lord. I love you from the bottom of my heart. I love God's people. And I will take as much time. Anybody, people have questions. And I'm like Brother Jason and Brother Mike. We never shut up. There's going to come a time that maybe you'll go to our funeral and we'll be the quietest person you've ever seen. And if you're, and I look forward to that day. Death can't scare me. During the COVID, the Lord showed me, run that ship through the storm. That's deliverance, real deliverance.